I wrote the book Apostate because I'm tired of losing. And I think a lot of people are tired of losing. We're looking at a decline of Christian influence, a decline in church attendance among the Christian nations, and it's been happening over 200 years. Europe is down to single digit church attendance. America is following closely behind. Uh, right now we're looking at about an 18% church attendance rate for millennials, down from 55% for the silent generation. That's a 75% drop in church involvement, which also means that the Christian faith will not be influencing culture here in America anymore. We are following in the footsteps of Europe. And, and my question is, how do we salvage the Christian faith? There are still some Christians left in the Western world. And, and we're asking the simple question, what happened in the modern day apostasy where hundreds of millions of people have walked away from a basic Christian confession? And, and the answer is there were powerful literary giants, philosophical giants, cultural giants that made this happen over the last 200 years. And I outlined that in my book, Apostate, The Men Who Destroyed the Christian West. The Christian West is in trouble. It's going downhill fast. I don't think the present society is recoverable. However, we may have another shot at recovering our social systems, our cultural systems, and something of a Christian civilization in another generation. Right now, we've come to the point at which uh, Christians will not be influencing culture and politics as they have over the previous 1,000 years in the Western world. That's just the way it's, it's going to work out, at least in the short term. What we're seeing is a decline in a, the influence of a Christian worldview in the minds of the mosaics, the millennial generation. According to George Barna in the survey he did on uh, modern youth, only a half a percent of mosaics still believe in absolutes, which would constitute the very basic uh, uh, foundational proposition of a Christian worldview. Only a half a percent. That's down from 14% in their parents' generation. That constitutes about a 97% drop-off uh, in terms of a Christian worldview in America over just the last generation. That's really significant. If only a half a percent of mosaics believe in absolutes, that means that the Christian faith is effectively non-relevant in, uh, in American society. And America is really the last bastion of, uh, of Christian culture and Christian civilization in the Western world. This is it. Uh, so what, right now we're fighting for a small remnant of those who believe in some basic Christian worldview. And, and I think we're fighting back from oblivion. Uh, we're also going to see a breakdown of civilization. Uh, our society is, is falling apart. Social systems have been eroded substantially. Uh, we're looking at half of marriages ending in divorce. 64% of kids born to millennial women are born outside of wedlock. Uh, this is a desperately difficult situation. Uh, I don't think we're going to recover from it very quickly. Uh, so what will happen is those functional families that still exist 60, 80, 100 years from now uh, may have the opportunity to rebuild faith and family and, and freedoms and a stable social political situation um, in another two or three generations. But for now, the, the old Christian West is done. We're going to have to rebuild a new one in the years to come. The recovery of a Christian worldview is essential at the university level, in the area of science, in the area of history, in the area of literature. The battle for science began in the 1960s when Henry Morris and John C. Whitcomb suggested that the biblical account of creation could be defended against the theory of evolution, and those battles began in the 1960s. Uh, to the point that many Christian colleges and Christian universities still take a Christian view, a distinctively Christian view on education seriously in the area of science. However, uh, Ken Ham did a survey on Christian colleges in America and found that twice as many liberal arts professors in the Christian colleges believed in old earth evolution versus the science department heads. And that's not because the liberal arts professors know more about science than science department teachers. It's because liberal arts professors are typically compromised 
typically they're liberal, typically they are not interested in engaging in the battle of ideas in the classroom as the science department heads are, are used to doing. So, so what I want to do is I want to bring the battle of ideas back into the area of literature and liberal arts. Uh, we've seen something of a battle of ideas in the area of science, now we need a battle of ideas in the area of literature and liberal arts. Th this is until there's a battle of ideas, until we get back into the engagement of ideas, uh, Christians are going to be largely irrelevant in the wider culture. So that's why the book Apostate, uh, addressing the philosophical giants that have affected the academy, the university, over the previous 600 years, 400 years, 200 years, and, uh, and we've also be addressing the literary giants, uh, men like Hemingway, Hawthorne, Mark Twain, and William Shakespeare. We're, we're actually getting into the content. We're not saying that they're bad writers. We're not saying that it's, it's not accomplished literary work of the highest order. We're not saying any of that. What we are saying is that the ideas espoused by these great minds, these great writers, uh, need to be taken to the mat. We need to get into the wrestling matches one more time. We need to get in the battle of ideas. We need to engage the war of the worldviews in the area of literature and liberal arts. We've been on the bench too long. And uh, Christian colleges, even Christian colleges, have hardly engaged the battle of ideas. Back in the days of Harvard, uh, in the 1700s, Yale, Princeton, uh, although they began as seminaries, uh, ostensibly Christian colleges and Christian seminaries, they, they over time would, would build a detente with the ideas of the humanists and the ideas of those who bore a different worldview. And they were unwilling to engage the battle of ideas and, and therefore were eventually synthesized or syncretized and, and compromised into a basically humanist way of looking at things. And that's why these once Christian schools like Yale that were very strongly Trinitarian, strongly Christian, preparing future pastors in America, eventually became the full bore secular schools they are today. Yale Sex Week was not celebrated in uh, 1790 under the President uh, uh, Timothy Dwight. Uh, Yale Sex Sex Week is, is popular today, but it was not an event in the 1790s. That's new. That's, that's a result of the radical secularization of education, uh, university by university, college by college in America. Mark Twain was the quintessential American author, probably the most popular author America has ever produced. Uh, he always turns out in the top one or two of the most influential authors, the most important books written ever in the history of the United States. Mark Twain is a giant in literature. He had probably the most important influence in Ernest Hemingway's life, as well as H.L. Mencken. Uh, he was a giant. Mark Twain is important because Mark Twain professed to be an apostate, one who hated the Christian God, and his hatred for the Christian God only increased every year of his life, all the way till a few weeks before he died, when he had some of the most acerbic, uh, blasphemous words probably ever written uh, concerning the Bible and the Christian God. His autobiographies have just recently been produced. Uh, they've discovered other books like his last book, Letters from the Earth, which was published in the 1960s. He made his daughter promise that those words would not be published till the end of his life. Letters from the Earth were letters, he said, were penned from Satan to the archangels. Some of the most frightening, eerily demonic words probably ever written in the history of the Christian light world or the, the world itself. Mark Twain's apostasy is a little difficult to trace on the front end. His father was a free thinker. So oftentimes these 19th century apostates came from a legacy of apostasy thanks to their fathers or their grandfathers. Charles Darwin would have been similar to that. But his mother took him to a Presbyterian church. He called himself a Presbyterian throughout his lifetime. Uh, but his mother began to see what was happening to him in his early 20s. And at one point his own mother said that she wished he had never survived his childhood. Now it's hard to imagine a mother who would say something like that of her son. 
but the tremendous uh, aggressive apostasy expressed in even books like Huckleberry Finn was shocking to those who still maintain the Christian faith in the 19th century. What makes Mark Twain so powerful is he is winsome, he's humorous. He's, he knows how to collect an audience and keep them entertained along the way. Uh, but his mockery of Christianity, his caricatures of Christians is, is marked throughout the book. Uh, the contrast between Huck, who's the happy-go-lucky, nice guy, and the Christian caricatures, who are sometimes jerks, sometimes just idiots, uh, is pretty clear to anybody who reads the book with a careful eye for this. Um, the Granger Fords are probably the most interesting family in which they have the Bible, Pilgrim's Progress, and their library, and they go to church on a Sunday morning, and then they kill each other on the afternoon. Uh, he, he really is sharp, and he's intense in pointing out the hypocrisy of American religiosity, American Christianity, and it's very possible there is a fair amount of hypocrisy in American Christianity. Uh, the problem is if you base your understanding of the Christian faith on a caricature, then you eventually will reject whatever the Bible presents as the Christian faith. And that's what has happened subsequently to the publication of Huckleberry Finn. The influences of Mark Twain are sometimes hard to identify. It is true that he read from Charles Darwin's works, but probably the person who influenced him the most was Thomas Paine, who wrote a book called The Age of Reason that ameliorated many of, of Mark Twain's concerns about the possibility of God existing and the possibility of God holding man to account for his sin and the possibilities of God's judgment. When he read, read Thomas Paine, it was a great deliverance from this idea of God, God looking over his shoulder and God holding him to account. That was a true relief to his soul. Uh, so Thomas Paine was probably the atheist that affected him more than anybody else. Over the last two years of his life, Mark Twain worked on his autobiography and another book called Letters from the Earth. Letters, he said, were penned from Satan to the archangels. These books were the reflection of his heart at that time, and he was spiraling downward fast as he approached his own death. He referred to the Bible as the most damnatory book ever printed. He referred to the biblical God as repulsive and malignant. He tried to concoct another God that was far worse than the God that he perceived the Bible presented. He, at the end, confessed that death was the best gift earth would ever give him. So his life spiraled into a nihilism and a hopelessness. Uh, because he could not see there to be a God. Part of his problem with this God is this God was a God of judgment who did not react very nicely to the problem of sin. And because the 19th century Christian world wasn't willing to deal with the depths of sin, the horrific nature of sin, or the atonement of Christ, the only solution for them was to deny the God of the Bible, the God of judgment, and, and create another God in their own image, or move towards agnosticism and atheism, which is what Mark Twain did. People engaged in liberal arts want to have the great conversation concerning the, the great literature and the great philosophies. I would rather suggest the great confrontation. We need to engage a battle of ideas. We don't want to assume that everybody agrees and all ideas are created equal. Uh, that assumption is extremely dangerous. It's one Christian 
liberal arts professor who, who created a compendium of the great writer, writers and literature. And he concludes that even Karl Marx had some really good things to say, it's just that he hasn't been interpreted well, he hasn't been applied well. Well, I happen to believe that Karl Marx had bad ideas. I think he was a bad man. I think he had bad ideas, a bad view of God, a bad view of metaphysics, a bad view of economics, a bad view of social theories, a bad view of history. I'm not sure he had much of anything good to say. We need to engage the war of ideas in the university classroom. Uh, Karl Marx's ideas produced awful consequences in places like China and Russia. Of course, Mark Twain would have been pleased because he liked Marx. He supported communist revolutionaries and hated Christian missionaries, wrote against them. He would have been happy to see that the communists persecuted Christians and killed missionaries in the latter part of the 1900s. That would have been a wonderful thing for him, but not for us. Uh, we believe that his ideas were wrong. Thomas Paine's ideas were wrong. Karl Marx's ideas were wrong. It's for us to engage the idea battle, show where the ungodly worldview has internal inconsistencies therein, and, and point out that there can be no true, absolute right and wrong in a universe without God. It is impossible to claim anything to be right or wrong. It's impossible to claim murder to be wrong. It's impossible to say that anything Hitler did was wrong or anything that Karl Marx did was wrong. If you're living in a world that is just matter in motion, just chemical processes uh, that are operating like grass growing in the backyard, we can't engage ideas. We can't assume right and wrong where there is no God, where there is no absolute truth or absolute ethic. We need to address that issue uh, with these great thinkers and point out their internal inconsistencies. They've got a worldview that is self-contradictory and, and yet they think their worldview trumps the Christian worldview. It doesn't. The Christian worldview in the end will survive and, and will overcome these ideas that have been so destructive to the family, to freedoms, to social structures in the Western world. I think time will bear this out. Uh, time will show that Karl Marx was wrong. Mark Twain was wrong. John Paul Sartre and his existentialism was wrong. Uh, Thomas Paine was wrong. Time will show that agnosticism, atheism, and uh, the sexual revolution that Mark Twain was so excited about and that has come about in the last 50 years, all of this is going to be proved to be wrong. History will show that God had it right in the Bible and, uh, and we need to be the ones arguing that case in universities and colleges and uh, in the lib liberal arts classrooms.